Hello everyone and welcome to Big Rock Moto. Thank you so much for tuning in today. In today's episode on the 2024 Husqvarna FE501S, we are going to start the build out process using parts from Takamoto and other suppliers. So in this episode, you'll get to see the install process of all these parts, plus a lot of the reasoning and the why behind why I'm using a lot of the parts that I've chosen. If you're going to purchase any of the parts in this video and keep in mind that Takamoto sells stuff for KTM, Beta, Husky, Honda motorcycles, just about all the performance dual sports, please use my links as it really helps support the channel and I really, really appreciate that. All right, so with that, let's get into the garage and let's get some of these parts installed. All right, let's talk about suspension and suspension modifications or improvements. So I've got the bike up on the scissor jack here, uh, getting it ready to take the suspension off to take it over to my buddy Mike Spurgeon, who's the owner of Takamoto Co. over in Las Vegas. I have to go to Las Vegas for some other stuff for the AIM Expo, so it makes sense to do this now while I'm going over there. So the factory suspension on the 2024 Husky and the KTMs is much improved from the previous generation of the Explore and the 4CS. So they've gone to the exact closed cartridge. The rear has the exact, you've got toolless adjustments here. Really good setup. However, that does not mean that it is sprung and valved for your weight, riding style, and how you have your bike set up. So if you want the optimal performance from your high performance dual sport motorcycle that you paid all this money for, you're going to need to have springs and valving that is suited to your weight. So for me, I'm about 200 pounds, 190 to 200 pounds. Uh, then I wear a pack, I wear my riding gear, my enduro boots, I carry the tools on my bike with a Moscow 10 liter bag. So probably uh, with all that being said and done, maybe around 230. And the bike is sprung for somewhere around 170, 180 pounds total weight. So unless you're a 150 pound rider with 20 pounds or 30 pounds of gear mo at most, you're overwhelming the factory springs. This changes the riding dynamic of the bike because you, you have the, the back sagging down too much. You have the, the compression too, or the, the suspension too far compressed into its stroke. Um, you, and you just don't have the right setup uh, for your weight. So again, that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> pull the suspension off. We'll pull off the forks, the front wheel, we'll pull the rear shock out, and we'll get this over to Las Vegas and have uh, Mike and his buddy over there at Frontline Suspension, I think his name is Ryan, we'll have them work their magic, and then we'll report back. All right, well, hopefully you saw in the little time lapse there, pulling the forks off of an enduro bike like this is really, there's not much to it. Pull the axle, pull the wheel off, uh, loosen the fork guards, take off the brake caliper, snip like one wire tie, loosen your triple clamp bolts, and then your forks will slide out. And now we're ready to take the forks. So we'll make sure to kind of degrease those before they go into the Jeep, you know. And now uh, I'm gonna work on the rear shock. All right, so for rear shock removal, take off the little plastic cover here that the Husky has. There's the upper shock bolt right there. Looks to be a 12 millimeter, maybe. Um, then you're gonna need to remove, so we have linkage on the Husky. This dog bone or link, this rear link bolt, then this link should slide up out of the way like that, allowing this to then drop out of the way, the swing arm pivot. Uh, and then uh, we can re remove the lower shock bolt. And then lastly, we'll remove the upper shock bolt. And it looks like this canister can kind of, the, the shock can kind of rotate like that so that this can clear the exhaust. It looks like there's enough room there. I hope that's the case. I don't want to have to pull the exhaust, but if we do have to pull the exhaust, then we can just pull it from here back. I don't think that's too big of a deal, but I'm hoping we don't have to do that. So let's uh, put on the time lapse and find out right now. Well, sometimes things turn out to be a little bit more difficult than they look at first sight. So in order to get the rear shock out, there was quite a bit more involved. A huge thanks to Kreft uh, Suspension or Kreft Racing on YouTube who had an amazing tutorial video about the easiest way to do this. So let me show you kind of just briefly what was involved. 
So you can see here, I've got the rear shock out of the bike. Now I couldn't get these rear, the whole problem started was, well, first of all, you can't get the rear shock through the swing arm. You have to pull the swing arm back at least part way or remove it like I have because the, the shock housing won't actually fit through that, that gap in the swing arm. So I couldn't get this link bolt out and then I was like, you know, something, there's tension here. So it turns out you have to take the swing arm pivot bolt out, which means the swing arm is going to fall back, which means you have to take the brake, uh, the rear brake apart, the rear brake cylinder thingy apart and a few other, a few other things like some wiring and stuff. It's not, it's not that bad once you actually do it. It's just kind of confusing. And then uh, get that off. I had to take the chain off. So you can see over here all the stuff that comes off. Here's the, the swing arm assembly, the rear master cylinder, the chain, which has a master link so that you can get that off, the rear tire, uh, the frame guards, the plastic frame guards. Um, and finally, here's the rear shock ready to go into suspension work. But yeah, so if you're doing this on your linkage style Husky or KTM, definitely look for that Kraft Racing uh, video. Uh, that was super helpful. But once you get the swing arm off, then it releases the tension on the rear shock linkage or the rear dog bone linkage, and that can come out, and then you can get the swing arm out, and then the shock just comes out no problem. So anyway, now we've got ourselves a hover bike. All right, look what we have here. The suspension is back. So uh, the company is Frontline Suspension. You can see the gentleman's card right here, Ryan Bunderson. So they... They partner up with Takomoto uh, to do this work. So what they did was they uh, changed the springs and the valving. So it's custom valving and custom spring rates for my weight and my riding style. They also put on the X-Trig preload adjuster on the rear shock. So you can use a, a socket to adjust your preload without removing the bike or removing the shock from the bike. Pardon me. Super excited to get this mounted back up. It's been a couple weeks because uh, there's been a lot going on and I wasn't able to film this because they weren't able to do this while I was there because uh, Ryan was, was sick actually with COVID so they had to ship this back to me later. But in any case, I'm going to get the bike buttoned back up with the suspension. We'll take care of some other mods along the way. And I really want to get back on this bike and start riding it again because I haven't ridden it for a couple weeks at least. And I've been busy with the new GS and the Tiger and trying to finish the series on the KLX. All right, you know the saying, one thing leads to another. So I got the rear shock back in, and then I realized I was like, oh, well, I've got all this other stuff I need to do. I gotta change the tires, I gotta put in rim locks, I've gotta put all these parts on. So I've got all sorts of stuff. I've got this Tusk rear disc protector. I've got these bulletproof designs, rear axle blocks. I'm putting on these uh, Sherby magnetized uh, swing arm protectors, which are really cool. Let's see, what else do we have here? I've got some uh, front, uh, front brake disc protector. I've got a seat concept seat. Uh, I've got, well, the Trail Tech Voyager stuff will come later. I'm gonna do the gas tank, I think, today. I've got these fork gaiters from Asherbis. Got the molecule skid plate. Um, here's some other stuff. So I've got like the anti-vibration dampeners. I've got protection for the, these are Enduro Hog from somewhere in Europe. Uh, protection for the side engine cases. Uh, jeez, man, I got, I got a lot of work to do more than I, more than I realized. I still haven't even put the chain back on. Got to get that cleaned up. So basically I'm building my own Husqvarna, right? <laughs> it's like build a bike day. So I'm going to keep working on this stuff uh, and we'll report back. But for now, what I want to do is get the suspension back installed. Uh, I'll put on the new tires. So the tires are over here somewhere. Uh, yes, here we go. Here's the Motaz tires. So I'm using the Tractionator IT rear and the ST front in the fatty size, a little bit wider. Here's the stock wheels and tires, so I need to get the tires mounted, balanced, uh, put the you know, heavy-duty tubes in, and anyway, I think I'm going to be here all night. <laughs> okay, so doing the tire change, a couple things I wanted to bring up. Um, I've been taught by some old pros, and of course Mike from Takamoto as well, use silicone lube or silicone grease on your tubes instead of baby powder. It just helps keep the tube lubricated, and it can... It, could potentially help prevent pinch flats where, because this can move a little bit and you may not get that pinch flat 
just makes things good. So we'll do that. You could also use moose lube. Um, I'm not running mooses because I want to be able to run this bike on the highway and mooses really aren't compatible with that. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up is rim locks. So I highly recommend using a rim lock um, because we're going to run lower pressures on an enduro bike. We want, we don't want the tire to spin uh, on the rim and tear the, tear the tube up and cause issues. These are Tusk uh, Billet Aluminum Rim Locks. They're really lightweight. They're lighter than the ones that KTM or Husky gives you in the box. So I like these Tusk ones. I think they're pretty cool. Um, I'll link to those below. I'll link to everything, of course. But so we'll get the rim lock and the tube in. We'll get this reassembled and then we'll do the front. All right, these are wheel weights by Taco Motoko. The thing I like about these is they're heavy enough that you don't have to use a bunch of them, right? The smaller wheel weights, which I have, they're not heavy enough to bounce out the rim lock. So you can see I've got my, I've got my assembly here on my Tusk balancing stand, which I'll also link below. I use this a lot. And you can see how out of balance that is. Look how much that thing is swaying back and forth. So the rim lock throws the balance of the wheel way, way off. And it's gonna give you a lot of vibration on the road. So after I was done changing with the Rabaconda, um, I'm gonna go ahead and balance out with these cool Takamoto rim locks. And then we'll get the thing back on the bike and then we'll have the rear end of the bike button back up. All right, you can see I've got the Motaz tires installed, looking very, very nice. Then I've got the, I put on these Acerbis uh, fork leg guards. See, they kind of wrap around the bottom here, give you some protection there. So that's cool. Uh, balance the wheels. Here's the rear tire. You can see the Motaz Enduro. Sorry, I'm getting used to a new camera, so excuse some of the camera motion. Uh, tusk discard there in matching blue. Got the swing arm protectors, which we, we talked about. Now, I'm doing some more upgrades along the way here as I go. So I'm doing the oil change. I've got the bike up on the lift right now. So what I'm doing is I'm putting on the Takamoto oil filter. So you can see here the oil filter. It's called the mother of all oil filters. It uses uh, magnets and in a way to filter the oil better than a paper filter would. Plus it's cleanable and reusable. The only disadvantage of this is it's a little bit expensive. Um, but this is used in heavy industries and there's a lot of uses for these. Uh, it's proven, a lot of people are running this and I'm super happy to be putting it in, in my Husky. You can see it's also nice pretty blue so we get some more nice more blue bling on here. And you can find out more information about the oil filter on the Tokomoto website. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit more as I put this oil filter in. So I'm on the Tokomoto website so I get this stuff right. So basically, what are the benefits of this versus like a paper or a stainless filter you might be familiar with? Uh, the magnetic filter, it can filter oil at a sub-micron level, less than one micron. Traditional paper options filter about 15 microns and stainless is about 30 microns. So by my math, that's 15 times better, or I guess 15, you know, it's a lot finer particle that it can filter. Also, there's no flow restriction. So if you think about it, a paper or a stainless filter would have a flow restriction as oil goes through there. Well, not the case with this new filter design. It's easy to clean, it's reusable. Uh, they say it's a 15 year lifespan, um, pretty crazy. So really easy to clean, use it forever. You can also see what's on your filter. So things will collect on this rod here over time and you can see you know, what's in your oil, what's on your filter, which you can't do very easily with a, with a paper filter. Um, so with better filtration, basically you can extend your oil change intervals a little bit, which some people are concerned about on these, these more racing oriented engines. So anyway, I think it's super, super awesome. I'm super happy that there's companies like Takamoto and Mike and all the people there that are innovating and creating you know, amazing new products for us to use on our motorcycles. I think it's fantastic. I've also got their oil fill plug. So this is a, goes on the other side here uh, and is nicer, you know, knurled thing to get on and off uh, for your oil. Uh, skid plate, so I went ahead and bought the Molecule Motorsports skid plate. You can see how it covers all the way. Uh, let me kind of kneel down here. You can see how it covers the linkage, okay? So it has the linkage guard built in. The factory skid plate, which comes on the Husky, uh, doesn't do that. 
So it's nice to have that extra protection. Plus this is so much thicker and stronger. It is a, uh, they use a special material. It's called like ultra high wear molecular polyethylene or something. It's pretty cool stuff. You can read about it on their website. Uh, but I like these good plates so much. I actually went out and bought it. I didn't get that sponsored at all. So anyway, we'll go away with the factory one. We'll put the molecule on after we do our oil change. We'll do some other upgrades here. And then after the oil change and skid plate are back on, I think I'm going to work on changing out the fuel tank and the seat, doing some more upgrades like that. What else have I got here? Uh, the tail tidy we still need to do. Uh, the tail tidy kit so we can mount our lights and license plate. I've got a front brake rotor guard. Uh, yeah. Oh, I've also got these case covers. These are from in, uh, Enduro Hog, somewhere in Europe. Uh, and these will go, these are high strength plastic. These will go bolt on here to protect our engine case from impacts and rocks and things like that. Doing the oil change on the Husky, you can see the oil filter is here. So it's real easy to access. And then you've got two drains here. You've got this, which is the oil screen. This hole is the oil uh, fill plug. So you can see here, let me try to get it in the light. Come on camera, there we go. You can see it does get a bit dirty, but it's good to have that screen. KTMs have really good oil filtrations. Sorry, I keep saying KTM, I mean Husky, you know, same thing. But they've got nice cleaning properties with the oil screen and then the oil filter as well as a secondary system. I think some of the older bikes had two screens. The new one just has the one. So we need to clean that up real well with like a brake cleaner or a parts cleaner. They also give you from the factory, I can try to get that to focus. I love this new camera. Um, a magnetic oil drain plug. So this comes from the factory. So I appreciate that. That's nice to have. So we clean that up. So we'll get this done, get the new oil filter installed, and then we'll be good to go. And then we got to fill the oil. You can see here I got these Enduro Hog covers mounted. I got the oil filter mounted. I got our oil added back in. I've also got the molecule skid plate installed here. It uses some bracket uh, there at the front, and then it wraps around the bottom. It covers the linkage. Really nice design. Very, very happy with that. Now, uh, oh, let me show you the, the cover on the other side. So I don't know if I recommend this brand, honestly. Uh, and I did pay for these. I did buy these, you know, just for myself because the bolt that they gave me for this bolt here was not long enough. So I ended up just using the front two bolts that replaced the case bolts. And then this back one here, um, I couldn't, I don't have a bolt that works. So I just had to go over. So this isn't, this isn't secured exactly how it's supposed to be but it actually works fine just like this. So I'm going to, I'm going to run them, but just so you know, that was an issue there. I don't know that I, maybe they just gave me the wrong bolts and it was just mine that got shipped that way, but I didn't really like to see that. So get whatever one that Takamoto sells, I think is going to be better than what these are. I just didn't find any for the 2024s when I went to look. So I'm changing the gas tank. So you can see here is the Acerbi, uh, is three gallon or 12 liter tank. The stock tank is about eight liters or two gallons. So, you know, these bikes are super easy to work on. A couple bolts, get the shrouds off, one bolt, the tank comes off, take the fuel pump uh, assembly out. We'll put the new tank in. I'll need to run to the gas station with a gas can to, uh, I guess, get some fresh premium fuel, or I guess I could try dumping this in there. But um, either way, we'll get this changed out and doing a few other things. Um, while I do this, but so far, you know, these bikes are just so simple, so much easier to work on than like the adventure bikes like that over there. So good day in the shop. Takamoto also sent out this uh, Golan fuel filter. So it's an extremely, a lot of, you know, if you're familiar with KTMs and Huskies, a lot of you are already using this, but uh, comes in a pretty blue and it's really good filtration for the fuel. So this goes somewhere in here. I got to figure out where, where we put this guy. Um, but that'll be a good upgrade on our fuel because if you get any any particles through the fuel system into your throttle body and your uh, fuel injection system, it's really bad on these bikes. So having good fuel filters is very important. All right, putting on a new fuel tank, I wanted to highlight uh, the concern that I have with the design of the new 2024s. For some reason now, the fuel pickup isn't down here in the bottom. So this is the aftermarket tank, right? But it works the same on the stock tank. You see all the, it's got all this capacity down here on the sides. Well, you can't really get to that unless you turn the bike on its side or upside down or something because you can see here the, the fuel pump, and this is the, the filter there on the end of it. Uh, 
there we go, camera. Uh, this is the fuel pump. It sticks down in here, and there's this this recess in the tank here where it picks up the fuel, but it's not getting the fuel from, how is it gonna get the fuel down here? So this is just a really stupid design. I don't understand why. I know the aftermarket, and I know Takamoto is also working on how do we deal with this, because you're not gonna be able to utilize the whole capacity of the tank. Um, yeah, so I, I don't get that design at all. But speaking of changing the fuel tank, I put you can see the uh, fuel filter right in there. It's really nice. Uh, and then the fuel tank just pops on. It just, I mean, it's really super easy to swap out. Truly, truly is. All right, if you saw uh, the second episode, you know that I my tail light assembly broke off. My license plate broke off. Then I had attached the license plate. I took a ride where I wasn't filming. I'd reattached the license plate and it broke off again. So anyway, I'm really ready for this next mod. So we're gonna do the Takamoto tail tidy kit and front turn signals and new switch gear. So here's everything you get in the kit. Uh, you get, let's see here. You get a new like harness with a new switch gear. This allows you to per control correctly all the new LED lights and everything that we're gonna be adding. All factory connections that just plug in. These are the slimline uh, turn signals. You can't use the fork wrap turn signals on the 2024s because of the way this war the way this blocks it. So you can see here the difference is obviously very clear. These are uh, flexible. They also have a running light feature, a uh, white running light and an amber turn signal, very, very bright. So that's very, very cool. Uh, what else do we get here? So this is the uh, tail light unit. It's very compact, very small, and it has built-in turn signals and brake light and running light. And you can even have a strobe function on this if you want when you apply the brakes. So that's very, very nice. This will all tuck it up in here. Uh, sorry, up in there and, and be a very nice solution. Because on these enduro bikes, stuff just gets ripped off the bikes on the trail and you fall and things break and rattle around. And I've also got this enduro plate license plate holder, uh, which is really cool because I think it, it's like magnetic or something. And then it, if you have a big in impact, it'll, it can move instead of like snapping off the license plate. Pretty innovative design. We'll show you that in a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. We'll start at the front of the bike. We'll take off the headlight assembly. We'll do our front turn to the wiring. We'll do our switch gear and then we'll go on from there. Also see the beautiful new seat concept seat. So this is the Comfort XL or Element uh, Comfort XL. The Element has these kind of grip uh, ribs on the back and I got the gray with a yellow stripe. I thought that looked pretty awesome to tie into the the rest of the design of the bike. So huge thank you to Seat Concepts for sponsoring this bike build and sending this out to me. I truly appreciate that. That's looking awesome. And the bike is really, really starting to come together. I'm super, super happy with it. All right, so you can see I've got, I've got to clean up my wiring here, but the install of the, of the front uh, turn signal kit, the new headlight, uh, control switch, turn to the control switch, the front signals is super good and they have an amazing installation video on YouTube for the 24 bikes, so make sure you do that. I've got the optional turn signals with the running lights. I'm gonna show you that here in a second. What I like about this, and by the way, yes, the LED headlight on the 24s is a huge improvement over the previous bikes, but we're still gonna change this out for a uh, Ruby Moto. What I like about this new switch, you can see right here, is that you've got a on and off. Uh, you can actually turn the headlight off now, whereas you couldn't with the uh, factory switch. Uh, and of course you have to turn tunnels in your horn. I gotta obviously do up my wiring. Um, let me show you how the cool running lights and turn tunnels work. So let me show you how the cool running lights and the turn tunnels work. I have to start the bike to activate the lighting system. So they'll turn off here in a second. There's a timed relay. Um, you can see how bright they are. Really awesome. Like super bright in person too. I don't know if they come up on the camera. I love the sequential LED uh, setup as well. 
So that's good. Now we have to move to the back and get the tail tidy done. All right, we can see here our tail tidy light is installed. Now it's hard to believe that this has turn signals, running light and brake light, but it does. I'll show you here in a second. I do have to turn the bike on to do that. You can see our inner fenders back on. I need to put my bolts back in, um, but then I'm gonna put, go ahead and put my license plate here and I'll report back on that. But to show you how, so everything should be nice and clean once you get this done. The wiring tucks under the ECU, the wiring, make sure you get it in the right channel and everything and just take your time. It's really not hard to do. You know, on these bikes, everything from here back is plastic. There's no more metal subframe after after about here. So all this back here is, is plastic, just for weight carrying considerations. So let me turn the bike on. There's the brake light. There's the turn signals. So that's pretty slick. That saves a ton of weight and it's not gonna break. It's tucked up in here, nothing to break off. I'm stoked with that. All right, she is looking good. So we're, I would say we're about halfway through with the overall build on this bike. Maybe, maybe even a little bit further than that. So I forget if I put all this stuff in the videos so far, it's just, it's hard to keep track. There's so much stuff going on. So just a quick recap. And you know, my goal with this bike is to have an all purpose off-road dual sport bike. It's comfortable. It can be comfortable to go down the highway, relatively comfortable at, you know, 60 miles an hour for, if you have to do that for an hour or something like that, but then being just an off-road weapon, right? And so it's really my off-road bike for the 2024 season. Uh, so starting at the back, so I've got this enduro plate. I just finished this. So this is cool because it, it, it actually is a strong magnet, but if you crash, it can go like this. So instead of like tearing the plate or whatever, uh, it just goes back on. So that's super cool. The, you know, we talked about the uh, all-in-one tail tidy kit. I've got a Motaz rear tire. That's the IT, the Acerbi frame protector, the Moscow Moto bags, seat columns, concepts, Element XL seat. Uh, we've got the engine protectors that we talked about. I've got the stock gearing for now, the Acerbi gas tank, frontline custom suspension, I've got my pro taper grips, the double take mirrors, the uh, we talked about the lighting and stuff we did. The, we've got the Moscow Nat handlebar bag. Uh, what else? I've got Tusk heated grips under here, which I still need to get wired in. I also still need to put on the trail tech. Uh, turn signals with the running lights. I put on this a front brake protector, which I don't really like. I uh, probably have to get a better one, but I don't want to get into that now. But it just doesn't wasn't very good. Um, Let's see, the exhaust cover by P3 Carbon Racing. I did put this on when the first thing I did to the bike. I did the molecule skid plate. We've still got the factory pegs for now, but we're gonna change those out. There's a cover that goes over this right here, but I need to set the sag. That's one more thing I need to do before we ride this. In this state, I set the sag once I have my tools and stuff loaded in here and I get dressed in riding gear, then we'll set the sag with my digital gauge. Uh, what else do we have? I mean, we've got that rear, rear discard there. I mean, anyway, this bike is phenomenal. It's really coming together. And then in this box of goodness here, I've got all sorts of cool stuff. I've got a battery. I've got the Get the Get ECU, which is a huge thing. I've got the Pro Mobile end cap, reflex hand guards. I've got the Trail Tech uh, Voyager Pro. We've still got to put on. Uh, there's a Ruby Moto R7 light in here. So tons more stuff yet to come. All right. So here's my secret weapon for checking the sag. It's important to set the the riding sag when you're fully geared up for proper handling. It is a critical, let me repeat that, critical to dial in the sag because there's riders of differing weights, differing luggage, and usually your springs are too soft, although we've done the suspension on this bike. So this is a Motul slacker. It's a, it, it connects to your phone and gives you the slack so you can sit on a bike and do it all by yourself. So if you've ever struggled with a measuring tape and having your spouse come out and try to do it, this, you see how it works? This has a string that you attach, or not a, a cable that you attach to the bike, and you can see uh, what your sag is. So we'll go out and do that and set it. Now, I've looked up in my owner's manual, and the owner's manual for my bike, and you make sure you're looking at your manual, not something you saw online, says 110 millimeters of riding sag. So that means that uh, 
you know, you, you, the bike sags down 110 millimeters from being completely unloaded with a shock fully extended to you sitting on it in your riding gear, helmet, boots, gear, camelback, everything like that, tools loaded on the bike, right? Most people have too much sag because they're overloading their spring. So we're going to go out and do that, and then uh, I'll try to, it's kind of hard to, to film it while I'm doing it, but I'll, I'll try. Okay, so here's this thing in action. You've got, it, it magnets right onto your axle, so you set that. You run the string up. These bags are a perfect place for me to attach this. Um, so I appreciate that. Now what you have to do, connects to your phone, you have to pull the bike so the shock's fully extended and the wheel wants to come off the ground. Then you hit the zero thing. Now you can see what, sorry. So it's zeroed out, shock's extended. Now when I start to push the bike down, you can see it's going up. That's in millimeters, so I'm looking for 110 when I'm sitting on the bike. So what I have to do now is, I don't have enough hands here because I'm not an octopus, I gotta put the camera away. I have to get on a bike while holding my phone and see where we are with the sag. This tool, this is the best freaking tool I ever bought. So um, you can see as I, as I kind of balance the bike here between my toes and try to get all the weight onto the shock, I'm right around that 110 mark. Now if I you know, you have to kind of sit on the bike where you think you're normally sit. If I sit further back, I can get more, a little bit, like up to 115. If I sit more in a proper riding position, which is kind of, you know, have my have my uh, butt kind of over the, the swing arm pivot or further forward, then I'm about 108. But I'm not wearing my helmet or my camelback, so, and I know I told you to do that, but, so I, I think I'm, I think I'm dialed in. I'm going to. I'm gonna leave with that for now. I think I'm right where I wanna be. I'll ride, I'll fee see how it feels. Now, if you feel like the front end's a little shaky, a little twitchy, you could dial add a little bit more sag. I've already set the forks to one line, which I prefer on these bikes. Um, if you wanted to steer faster, you could reduce the sag a little bit. But I'm pretty happy with with this number right here. This friggin' tool is amazing. I could never do this by myself without this tool. The only things that I've really changed that affect it are the seat. You know, the seat is a dramatic improvement. I actually rode this bike, uh, we rode almost 200 miles in Death Valley on one of our rides, and I, I didn't have much, much if any discomfort on the seat, so the seat is a huge win. Uh, in terms of riding on the highway, you know, I feel like about 60 miles an hour maybe 65 is about the max that I want to cruise at with the 1448 gears. So I'm going to try 1445 gearing and see how that does. Uh, we'll, we'll try that in one of the next videos. My main complaint here, my main issue is getting rid of the vibrations. You know, there's so much vibration coming through the foot pegs and through the handlebars that once you're, if you ride for more than a couple hours, it, it's a real issue. So I've got to do either the, the Mako or the flex bars or get, you know, do a bunch of stuff to get the vibration out of here. Um, and then for foot pegs, uh, I've got some different foot peg options, but I think I'm going to get the ones that have the rubber isolation uh, to help kill the vibes. I had those on my 350 and I really liked them. So um, I think if we could deal with the vibration, maybe lengthen the gearing a little bit. This wouldn't be a terrible bike to have to spend a couple hours on the highway with. So there's some changes there I think we could do. We just have to be sure that we don't kind of mess up the bike's off-road capabilities and, and, you know, too much by doing those things because this thing is really an off-road machine. That's what it's designed for. All right, I've come back to the same trail that we did the first ride video on when the bike was totally stock, and what a difference. We certainly have a lot of cool upgrades. I think the thing that we're going to notice most is, well, the change in the tires is dramatic, the change in the suspension is going to be <coughs> dramatic as well, keeping in mind that that's kind of still breaking in, and I need to probably still make some adjustments with the suspension. I have the suspension kind of on the, the comfort settings, uh, because playing around with it, I found it was a bit firm, um, the way that it came back from the suspension shop so let's just do a little riding so like when I hit that big G out there when I hit something big like this the difference I notice is that it feels like there's no way I could bottom it out it's so firm
<laughs> yeah, there's so much better control in the suspension. Like, I feel like I can definitely ride faster. Yeah, holy moly, this thing is amazing now. Like, it still is pretty plush over the the rocks and stuff like that, but man, you can really ride this thing quick. I definitely do need to get a steering, uh, steering stabilizer, though, for sure, on this bike. <laughs> you! <laughs> Whoa, this is fun. Man. What a difference too in the uh, in the tires. The tires give me so much more confidence. <laughs> oh, this thing is such a riot. <laughs> <laughs> God is saying it it turns so sharp it's these bikes handle so quick <laughs> Woo! You! <laughs> hey, look at that. Our license plate's not falling off this time. I love this thing, by the way. Wow, what a machine. What a machine. All right, well, I hope you've all enjoyed this uh, video, this process of going through, putting on a lot of these upgrades, taking the bike for a ride, and talking through some of the reasoning behind it. If you have questions or concerns or comments about any of this stuff, please let me know. Again, please use my links when you're shopping for dual sport parts at Takamoto or other retailers out there. Stay tuned because there's a ton more coming with this bike build. This is just getting started on the parts. This is probably maybe a third of the way through. And I have some pretty cool and exciting stuff because I think I'm gonna turn this bike into a super lightweight, adventure machine and i've got some really cool exciting new stuff coming for you guys so please stay tuned for that thank you so much for watching ride safe and i'll see you out there